Bhagavato Arahato Samma Samputasa Nakmo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Samputasa Nakmo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Samputasa Putang Tamang Sankang Namasami So warm greetings to you wherever you are Sanatananan as uh, requested that I share one talk. I believe you're about halfway through your retreat now. I've noticed that I think this is the third retreat, online retreat that Tanajan has taught this year, and it's only March. So uh, it's good to, I'm sure you do, but it's also, I'm sure you already recognize your good fortune but it is uh, nice to recollect our good fortune and to rejoice. We recognize uh, the blessings that are manifesting in our life. Uh, it is unusual. I've been a bhikkhu for 27 years and uh, in our community for nearly 30 years. And uh, so I know it is not common. It is unusual for a monk of Tanajan's caliber to avail himself to this degree, to teaching the lay people. So that is your good fortune. Uh, most of the abbots and teachers in their monasteries have many duties already. They're already teaching the, the local people, training the monks, receiving guests. So it's uh, an expression of Tanajan's uh, large amounts of compassion, I would say, that he goes to all this extra effort to encourage you. So that's your good fortune. I rejoice in your good fortune. And then when we have such opportunities, it is good to avail ourselves to them and uh, give ourselves rise to the occasion. Take it seriously, practice seriously. Uh, we never know, Tanajan will be turning 70 a couple of days, so we, don't, we never know how long our teachers are going to be with us. So it's... Uh, Good thing, Tanajan is teaching. Good thing that many of you are joining these retreats. And uh, I hope your practice is going well. Just thinking a little bit about why, why do we do retreats? Why do we do more meditation more frequently for a number of days? <clears throat> I think you all, we are, this is essentially things that we all know, but it's just nice to review and uh, recollect what are we doing, why are we doing it, how's it going. And uh, so in our, in our daily lives, when we're not in retreat, we have our kind of conventional reality self. We have our life and uh, the way the self-view functions in the mind for most people it's uh, from as soon as you wake up you know i had a good sleep i didn't have a good sleep i feel rested i feel drowsy or i have a backache or i have a headache or i feel tired i feel refreshed i feel great whatever it may be we start interpreting the experience of the body and the emotions as i and mine and then when you start to see other people, those are the other selves. Then it starts to be self and others. So this is normal. This is conventional reality. We don't, we don't have to make a problem with conventional reality, but we do, have to, we, have, we do understand that conventional reality is bound by dukkha. So Lord Buddha explains that there's a deeper reality, an ultimate reality, that uh, when we cultivate the Eightfold Path, we will begin to have glimpses into a, a deeper reality, which, as Lord Buddha describes, is anatta, not self. So the ordinary mind 
of most people is quite dark. So that's the kind of ordinary state. The word patujana kind of means thick, kind of thick with darkness. And uh, that's if you have a strong sense of self and the mind is affected by the five hindrances most of the time, which for most people it is, then it's natural for the mind to be dark. That's the state of the world, worldling. For those people who have good, uh, good roots or good karmic conditions, have uh, been inclining themselves to go from darkness towards the light, people start to keep ethical precepts, take on some spiritual practices, listen to teachings, contemplate wisely, people become the kalyana jana, the lovely being, a being that is well disposed and uh, <clears throat> intent upon goodness. The kalyana jana, the lovely being, is still a self, right? It's still a, a being working with the conditions. The Eightfold Path are conditions, and uh, it's working with karma, and it's working with conventional reality, but it's it's like the raft that leads to the other shore. It's the conditions that lead to the unconditioned. So when we cultivate, when we have right view, we believe in uh, the Buddha. We believe the Buddha was enlightened. Nibbana is real, can be realized by those who practice correctly, practice rightly. We have the right intentions. We practice right thought, try to think skillfully right livelihood, right action. And we get into these areas of right mindfulness, right concentration. Then we, we'll, in the practice of meditation, when we're, when we're cultivating the, the bhavana, Eightfold Path is sometimes uh, condensed as dana sila bhavana, generosity, ethical training, and mental cultivation. When we get around to doing our meditation, this is when we're actively working to reduce the amount of darkness in the mind. And sometimes, something I wanted to talk about today was sometimes you can't really see how it's working or whether it's working or that it is working. And so sometimes just describing it as a way of affirming that uh, I have great faith that it does work practice of cultivating mindfulness and of doing a more formal meditation it definitely works. So how does it work? So when you come to sit and you're practicing noble silence or speaking less, being more circumspect, just in the, in the act of not talking with people as much, because when we talk, we tend to tell stories, how our day has been, what we're feeling, what our opinions are, what we think about what's going on in the news. So there's a self with a bunch of opinions. This is normal. And then there's the other person, well, they'll share their opinions and their thoughts and their experience. Okay, another self with a, a whole bunch of other opinions. Just in the act of not doing that, just in the act of not verbalizing, articulating, the amount of proliferation about self and other begins to come down a bit. So just in doing that, there's less darkness and then when we come to be with our meditation object it's a, it's a difficult thing to understand how profound and powerful it is but simply by being with the breath for example it's being giving the interest giving the attention to the breathing the feeling of the breath coming in the feeling of the breath coming out knowing the beginning middle and end an entire in-breath, keeping presence of mind where you're observing the breath in between the in and out breaths, knowing the beginning and end of an out breath. Similarly with footsteps, just knowing when you're lifting the foot, knowing when you're placing the foot. When we're doing this, we're not creating a world. We're not creating a self. The mind isn't flowing out into the, what they call the asavas, the outflows, karma asava, avicca asava, bhava asava. It's not flowing out into becoming, 
It's not flowing out into sensuality. It's not, it's not feeding more ignorance. And this is very profound. And so when you feel like, so for a person, we all know some well-practiced monks who have a divine eye. If they, if they can, you see, that's like, this is similar to eye consciousness, but it's more subtle. They can see the subtle world, subtle bodies and things like that, ghosts, devas, etc. But if, when a person is keeping their ethical precepts, being generous, has some merit, the mind is already beginning to brighten up, but it's not clear yet. It's, kind of, it's brighter than worldly beings, but it's not like a clear brightness. Then, but when that person then trains their mindfulness more consistently in all the postures and with frequent meditation, it begins to become bright and clear. And so a, a practitioner who has a divine eye can see at a glance whose mind is brighter, whose mind is lighter. Who, and we, I think we can all see this when, you know, you finish your retreat and you look at each other's faces when you do an in-person retreat. And everybody looks so bright on the last day. So when you're sitting there and you're making your effort to be with your mind object, to be with your meditation object, and you keep making that effort, how it's experienced, if you know, most of us won't have the divine eye, we can't see the level of darkness or the level of brightness. But when you start to feel lighter, and when you can feel that your mind is brighter, that really is the case. Your mind is lighter, your mind is brighter, because you're not picking up the darkness of the world, you know, sending the mind out into the world and bringing the world back into your mind. And this is extremely valuable and extremely powerful, more powerful than most of us realize, because with the, the way the self-view works and the way we've all been socialized and conditioned, we want results. We want to see tangible signs of progress. And with meditation, sometimes there are kind of signposts, sometimes there are breakthroughs. But in general, a lot of, a lot of meditation sessions have a quality of kind of ordinariness to them. And what I kind of wanted to mirror back to people today is that is that quality of ordinariness is in itself actually wonderful. And a quality of ordinariness is uh, what, what we don't have when the mind seems kind of ordinary is we don't have a lot of suffering. What, what we want is amazing bliss. What we want is unshakable one-pointedness. One but just to go through the effort of sitting putting down the more coarse forms of suffering, being more or less with your meditation object, feeling lighter, feeling brighter, not having a mind that feels oppressed by darkness, this is correct practice. And this is something that is going to lead to profound insights, to amazing samadhi, because it's this just not making karma with the darkness anymore. It's the bringing, the, reining the mind in from the world and uh, doing the chanting, the Dhamma, leading inwards. And that, that leading inwards leads onwards. So it's simply when we, we come, we pred meditate, sit meditation. We come, we listen to Dhamma. We do a session of walking. We do some chanting. All of that time when the, just allowing the mind to have less cause suffering, more of a quality of presence of mind, more of a sense of clarity, more of a sense of brightness. This is correct practice, and this is powerful practice, and this is profound. But you don't get the amazing peak moments all the time. They, they come in their own time when we sow the conditions. But these are the conditions. This is the practice. And so recently I was in Bodh Gaya, and I was sitting for about eight and a half hours a day at the Bodhi tree. I did that for four weeks. Uh, Kuba Cho and uh, Venerable Sampano joined me, Mei Chi Ying. And I noticed this. I noticed that oftentimes, sometimes the mind would become peaceful, tangibly peaceful, and after the meditation, there would be a sense of, oh, that was a really nice, that was a good sit. I'm sitting more or less three, three-hour sessions. 
But there were other times when I was kind of feeling like it's not quite coming together. There's some hindrances and there's some hindrances and some hindrances. And it, for the experience, it kind of felt like nothing was happening and it wasn't a very good sit. But then what would happen is I would open my eyes and I would go to the bathroom and I would notice that sense contact wasn't affecting the mind very much. And there was a feeling of feeling a bit like floating. There was a lightness of body and lightness of mind and kind of easeful joy as I walked to the bathroom and noises and smells and things that might normally bother me didn't bother me. And it's like, isn't that interesting? Sometimes when you're meditating, it's like looking through a microscope or looking through a magnifying glass and you see the hindrances more subtly and you see, you see your habits more subtly and so it feels like nothing's happening. But if you, you put down the magnifying glass and you put on your more ordinary glasses and you can notice actually the mind is brighter, the mind is lighter, it's less oppressed, there's less darkness. And so practicing in Bogai is very interesting like that because it's not like a retreat situation where, you know, if you're in already in a quiet place, you might not notice. I remember having one of, an experience where I was like, oh, my meditation isn't really going very well. So I took out my earplugs and I took off my hat and I just looked around me. Sometimes I like to look at what other people are doing to rejoice in what they're doing to feel some mudita. And I had this interesting kind of shift of perception where when I stopped trying to meditate and I just allowed the mind to relax and looked around me, I could actually hear the relative silence of my mind compared to all of the noise around me. But just moments before I was sitting there thinking, oh, this sitting isn't really going very well. So it's like the point I'm making is our practice does bring results and whatever good efforts we make, they are brightening the mind. The mind is engaged in the process of purification simply by not feeding strong sense of self with a lot of aversion or irritation, simply by trying to see the hindrances as hindrances and trying to let them go, simply by making the effort to try to be with the meditation object, try to be the meditation object. There's less darkness, there's more brightness, there's more lightness. Another thing that we can't quite see in the process, it's like, it's like you're taking one step. So you can't see how, how far you're going on the journey. You can't see how much closer the finish line is coming. You're kind of mindful of that step. But every step is bringing you closer to the goal. Every step is a step along the path. And so a lot of the steps in the process of working towards your liberation and your enlightenment have a very, very ordinary quality to them. And I, and I want people to feel okay with that and feel confident. Ordinariness is okay because uh, spiritual practice isn't about being special. And it's not even, it's not about special experiences. And uh, in my experience of, of peacefulness, whatever experience I have, it's like the ordinariness gets more profound. It's more profoundly ordinary. And it's like the state of when the hindrances are affecting the mind, that's an agitated state. When there's a strong sense of self, when there's any of the various key lasers banging around in the mind, that's an agitated state. That's not a normal state. That's a kind of an abnormal state. And then, although it's common, but then when, when meditation is going okay, there's some subtle hindrances, there's some annoying thoughts, there's some little irritations, some little cravings, but there's more spaciousness, there's more lightness, there's more brightness, there's more peace. And then there's periods of peace. One of the things that we can't see is whatever efforts we make in this way is producing a very powerful type of punya, merit. And the particular merit that it produces, and it's like one of those things, like how can just sitting there feeling somewhat contented, somewhat peaceful, but not feeling something any particularly profound, how can that be making merit? And I think it's really good to understand that it does. Because the degree to which the mind is not engaging with and picking up and making karma with darkness, the great degree to which the mind is lightening and brightening, becoming more spacious, is a degree to which the mind is possessed of merit and, and you experience some of the merit in the moment manifesting as some relative peacefulness. The, but the thing that we can't see in that moment, but Sanajananan has explained this in other Dhamma talks, is the merit 
that comes from this kind of spiritual practice is the, is the merit that will support the deepening of that spiritual practice. So it's like your ordinary sit today is the cause for your profound sit later in the evening or your profound sit next week or whenever it happens. And that's something, it's something you can't quite see as I keep saying, because it's, it just seems so ordinary. But the, the, the merit of bringing your mind to its natural, another word for ordinary might be natural, you know, bringing the mind to its natural state where it's not affected by craving for or craving not for, bringing the mind to a state of naturalness is what's going to lead to perceiving deeper levels of nature. So when you're not making karma with the dark qualities that obscure ultimate nature, deeper nature. And when we glimpse nature more deeply, layers of ignorance fall off the mind. And then when the ignorance is kind of thinned and we have moments where we pierce through it and you ex experience tanajanan talks about, you know, the jhanic states, but he also talks about periods of temporary liberation. Where the mind of an ordinary practitioner, if they practice sincerely enough, consistently enough, can actually experience a liberated state for a period of time. They can experience a mind that is not oppressed by the five hindrances. They can experience a mind that doesn't have the self view functioning in it. This is the thing about we, we don't make karma feeding a sense of self, expressing our opinions, sharing our views, having conversations. And we just stop doing that for periods of time. Be a little bit quiet. Come back to your meditation object. Then you see that, that the self view obscures the deeper nature, the ultimate nature, that which knows emptiness. You know, emptiness of self, emptiness of permanence, and also emptiness of suffering when the mind really perceives vast, spacious emptiness, there's, there is that which knows emptiness and that that knows the emptiness has no suffering. So there's no self there suffering. There's awareness that knows the empty nature of all phenomenon. And so we do in the course of practice have some profound experiences we have to sow the causes. But another thing I wanted to mention was whatever experience I have had of those more kind of amazing, or in hindsight, they're amazing. In hindsight, they're profound. But as, but as I said before, when you actually experience it, it's just even more normal, even more ordinary. The wondrous state of the natural mind perceiving deeper nature. And then you come out of that experience and it's like, oh, so peaceful. Why is it peaceful? Because there was no sense of self there, liking and disliking and commenting. And so we will experience those insights into not self, those insights into emptiness if we keep practicing. But the ordinary sits where it seems like not much is happening, that is what is ripening those spiritual powers. That is what is ripening those, uh, those factors of enlightenment, the seven factors of enlightenment, just making the efforts and uh, the great results will come. So what I was going to say was when I've had, whatever experience I've had of when the mind came together in a more deeper period of samadhi or the mind had some kind of a experience of letting go and there was a, a more profound sense of emptiness, in the moments before that, I never would have known. It's not like it's not like a chronological thing where it's like it's getting better, it's getting better, it's getting better, and then boom. Sometimes you can really be struggling with the hindrance, and and, they, and then you get fed up with the hindrance, and might be a certain type of craving, and then you get irritated with the craving, but then you keep making the effort to be mindful, keep making the effort to be mindful, and then boom, the mind experiences some kind of unshakable stillness for a period of time. But you, I didn't know before that happened that that was about to happen. Again, there might be some craving, and it's okay, fine, and do it. Do the body contemplation. 
stop going into sensuality, come on, see these parts of the body, apply the mindfulness that you have of just knowing the body as elements, not a self, see it as elements, then try to separate that awareness from the element. And there have been moments where there's been a big letting go and there's no self suffering with any craving. But just minutes before that, there was a self that was struggling with sensuality and desire. And so just giving those examples as an encouragement that your what seems to be ordinary practice, ordinary little bit of peacefulness, a little bit of brightness, a little bit of lightness, a little bit of more sense of space, if we don't let up, if we are consistent, becomes periods of much more brightness, much more lightness, and much more space. And then uh, that's producing merit, that's producing the habits, that's producing the conditions that you will eventually have the liberating insight. So Tanajananan, he does talk about kanika samadhi, those peaceful states of, of in just a few minutes. Becoming somewhat adept at bringing your mind to experience a few minutes of peacefulness is what lays the conditions to have the upajara samadhi, 10, 15, 20 minutes of peacefulness. Becoming somewhat adept at bringing the mind to a state of 10, 15, 20 minutes of peacefulness is what lays the conditions for the mind to experience a deeper kind of unmoving, the apana samadhi, that can go for longer periods and be deeper. Similarly, when we're investigating, we, maybe there's some craving or may, and you apply body contemplation and the hindrance drops away. It's a little liberation from that hindrance, some kind of sexual fantasy or something. Very common. And, uh, when you apply the remedy, look at the body parts, the hindrance falls away. There's a little experience of liberation from that hindrance. When there's irritation or aversion, and then you notice how that causes you suffering and you spread metta, and the metta really starts to flow in your mind, then that aversion falls away. And you can notice the mind that is liberated for, for, from the aversion through applying the appropriate remedy. And just as we have those little liberations from the hindrances and the uh, little experiences of being with a wholesome meditation object, that's what lays the foundation for noticing the conditions and the characteristics, noticing the arising, the ceasing, the arising, the ceasing, and having the more profound insight on the level of the vipassana jnana, where you have some insight into not self. You can experience the body and the mind with no sense of self present. And then what you notice, if you're able to have a vipassana jnana, is that when there's no sense of self present, there's no suffering at all. Because there's no one there interpreting experience as suffering. And then those kind of experiences, those vipassana jnanas, that lays the foundation, the wisdom barami, the wisdom spiritual power, that lays the foundation for the more profound insights that, that monk, teach masters like Tanajana can describe when they were practicing doing their body contemplations, etc. that the sense of self falls away, that the body uh, is perceived as empty, and then the they experience great profound emptiness and a period of liberation and the mind changes in a way that it can no longer, it cannot degenerate from that state, having gone into the past, entered the stream of Dhamma. So the small moments of peacefulness, if we are consistent, become deeper moments of peacefulness. The small letting goes, liberations from the ordinary hindrances that oppress the mind, lay the foundations for the deeper insights and those deeper insights lay the foundation for the liberating insight. But it's, <clears throat> it all comes from this consistent, regular practice where every little effort that we make to brighten the mind up and bring the mind to an ordinary state, not falling into liking and disliking, applying appropriate remedies if your mind becomes oppressed by a kilesa or a hindrance, and just keeping on trying. And uh, knowing phenomenon, putting it down knowing phenomenon, putting it down. In the ordinary world, we have to think. We have to follow a thought, pick up a thought. We have to learn to use our thoughts. In meditation, a lot of practice is knowing a thought, knowing your thinking, dropping it. Knowing a thought, dropping it. Knowing it, dropping it. Just knowing things and putting them down, getting practice at putting things down. And when we do this, we get practice of putting down the hindrances. 
Yet practice of putting down the hindrances, concentration, samadhi is the result. The mind gathers, the mind collects. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about the general process and I wanted to affirm that the practices that you are doing are working, that you are taking steps along the journey. Uh, one various ways that Tanajan Anand has described it, he said, you know, the more that you are with Bhutto, suppose you're doing breath meditation and you're, do, you're with Bhutto, breathing in Bhut, breathing out Do, or you're with your walking meditation, one footstep Bhut, another footstep Do. The more the mind is consistently in the body with the object and has Bhutto, Nibbana is literally coming closer, closer and closer and closer. But we can't see it from the perspective of the being whose mind is affected by ignorance. But someone like Tanajananan can see that. When you're practicing well, you know, Nibbana is coming closer, Nibbana is coming closer. You keep practice, you keep being consistent, you're going to start to glimpse Nibbana. You're going to start to experience Nibbana. So I wish you every a lot of energy, a lot of faith, a lot of inspiration. But as well as energy, faith, and inspiration, I wish you a lot of patience, a lot of contentment with plodding ordinariness, understanding that that is what's going to bring the profound experiences. And then we just keep going. So I hope something I've shared with you may have been useful to you. And I'll also give people the opportunity to ask some questions if you have any. Wishing you all the best in your practice. Andamaya o vadagata sadu karang kadamasi sadu 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 anumodami. for the Dhamma talk. Uh, yeah, so if anyone has any questions they'd like to ask, they can raise their hand or they can send the questions in via the chat box and uh, we can read them out. Anushka. Hello, Ajahn Acharya. Hi. Um, Ajahn, you just mentioned about uh, watching the elements. Um, would you please uh, talk a little bit about how you do that, please? Yeah. I would appreciate that. Thank yes. you. So it's it's actually part of the uh, Samanera ordination ceremony <clears throat> that the preceptor gives the the one going forth. It's called Papacha, going forth. He gives them their first meditation object, which is to know the hair of the head, hair on the body, nails, teeth, and skin. And we, we it said in Pali, of course, kesa, loma, nakha, tanta, tacho. And so that's our, our first meditation instruction from our preceptor. We train in knowing those elements first as we see them as their separate part. So just in, just in seeing hair on the head as just hair, we're already in, in simply doing that. We're not. We're not creating a self. We're not. We're not being vain. We're not. We don't care about the hairstyle. We don't care about the length. We don't care how much grey there is. We just know that it's hair. And then we also contemplate then that it's earth element. So all of these elements have a dry quality, and they're on the outside of the body. The teeth and the nails. I think it's somewhat even easier because they're hard. You know. And so just as you would become aware of your in-breath foot, your in-breath toe, you get, you get familiar with holding awareness within the parameters of the body. You then bring this mindful awareness and just place it in that area. So you just know, mindfully know hair is hair. You don't have to think about it a lot. You just know that hair is hair. And you just know that that's earth element. And then similarly with the teeth it's like little rows of white pebbles in the mouth you just, just know this hard thing is like a stone you just know teeth and you can use the you can say it in your language breathing in teeth breathing out teeth or 
I use the Pali, breathing in Danta, breathing out Danta, just similar method. Still with the breath, still with a mental recitation, broadly aware of the press, but placing the awareness on that area and just knowing teeth is teeth and then knowing that teeth is earth. What happens is if we do this a lot and we do it consistently, the mind really can concentrate on just teeth. And so it's like you, with your eyes closed, your mind's eye will see the teeth and just the teeth, not the gums, not the blood, not anything, just the teeth. And so then there's kind of a, the obvious result is that, it's a, is that one sees that the body is not self. Because we, we have this tendency to interpret the whole thing functioning altogether as me, my body, I, mine. But when you start to see it in parts and you see very, very clearly, these are like rows of little white pebbles. They're like stone, it's earth. And then when a person gets adept at knowing earth element as earth element with right mindfulness and right concentration, one can then also separate eventually separate the awareness of that which knows earth element as earth element from from the known and can have quite profound insights it's like in letting go of that little bit of earth element you can let go of your attachment to all earth elements and then people have these temporary liberation experience where the mind lets go of the world because the world that we're in is made of the four elements yeah. That's, so that's where it goes, and uh, but many great practitioners, and particularly in this day and age where people do have issues with thinking, because we were, we've, been all, we've all been through an education system, we've all, all been educated, and so we've been taught to think, formulate opinions, speculate, and uh, comment endlessly. Previous generations possibly had less of that, you know, rice farmers, basket weavers, fishing people, people that did a simple task that was very reflective, repetitive. They probably had less discursive, constant thinking about things and commenting on things. So it seems to be the case that for modern people, using thought a little bit and using contemplation a little bit is often the gateway into the actual liberation experiences. So for Lumpur Man, for Lumpur Cha, for Tanajan Anand, this uh, body contemplation component of practice was, was very instrumental in their big breakthroughs when it, when it really went from the small insight to the very big insight, insight, from the small letting go to the profound letting go. And so it's one of those things, I'm glad you asked the question because it sounds so simple and it seems so kind of boring in a way that people overlook it. They don't realize what a jewel, what an incredible tool we have. And just to train your mindful awareness to be mindful as teeth as teeth, people don't realize that that can become Nibbana. <laughs> but it really does. It really can and really does. And we have uh, a lot of examples of great practitioners who did body contemplation and then were able to see from the body parts which one was which element and then separate the awareness from that element and have quite profound letting goes. Because our attachment is based on perceiving this body as us, most of our attachment. So if we can see a part of it clearly as just that part, then see that part as that element, and then let go for periods of time, the letting go can go from small to profound to complete letting go. I'll do yeah. Is that yeah. when the mind separates from the body as well? Like, it's like uh, separating awareness, separating that which knows from that which is known. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. And oftentimes people do the, you know, the hair, hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth and skin is the beginning. Once you know how to do that, often people do the skeleton. So yes. the ati, the bones. And uh, when the knowing the skeleton, particularly like things like that, if you, if you watch breath, if you observe the breath in the nose, right, and you get a sense of a skull, you yes. can be aware of the breath and then you can actually see the skull there. If you're aware of the breath in the chest area, you might get a sense for the spine, just mm -hmm. holding, holding the body up. And there's awareness of the spine while you're doing this. And then, yeah, the sense of self can fall away because when the mi right mindfulness sees a spine as a spine as bones, there's no self there, right? 
And yeah. so, so it's a natural, the natural response of just picking that meditation object up is the delusion of misapprehending it, perceiving it incorrectly. That just falls away because the mind is perceiving it more correctly. Oh, it's fine, it's just fine, it's bones. It's not mm. I, it's not mine. The self view falls away. So no one's breathing. That's it. There's just the breath. There's just yeah. Nama and Rupa not affected by the self view. Oh, thank you, Sadhu Ajahn. Good to see you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. In my practice in Bogaya, I was using mostly breath meditation, but probably about half of it was metta because there's a lot of impingement and you can fall into irritation. So probably about half of it was metta, and then probably about a quarter of it was contemplating the body as elements, and then the other 25% was just being with the breath once the mind was actually peaceful, just being with the in-breath, being with the out-breath as a sense of spaciousness. But we do need to use these other samatha practices and contemplative practices to cultivate our toolkit of the, the various things we use to... Tanajan Anand says, keep the mind in the middle, don't fall into liking and disliking, but we need to we need to cultivate the tools that enable us to do that to bring the mind to a state of balance, a state of clarity. Another question, Anushka? Yeah. Um, may I please ask you to explain the way you practice that metta meditation, please? Thank you. Yeah. So the way. The way I do it usually starts with compassion, and it usually starts with compassion for myself. So here I am. I've been a monk, for, monk and a novice for 28 years. I still have suffering. So w when your mind gets more sensitive, your sensitivity to suffering also gets more. So it's like, you know, even if you have a little bit of suffering, you're, you're aware of your suffering. Mm -hmm. That's part of right mindfulness is to know suffering characteristic. And so when I, if I'm, Suppose I'm under the Bodhi tree and there's some person talking loudly right next to me and it's, you know, the mind starts to go into this is inappropriate, this is the place of the Buddha's enlightenment, this is the sign up on the tree that says silent here, you, should, you know, it's like the mind starts going into that. Then what I do, because I'm not going to tell every person that talks too much under the Bodhi tree to shut up because you would, where would you start and where would you stop? You'd be walking around telling people to shut up all day. And that's not a path to liberation as far as I'm aware. So we have to tell ourselves to shut up <laughs> with metta, of course. And so, you know, I look at that beginning of feeling of irritation and that wanting to express the irritation. That's an unpleasant feeling. And so I notice the unpleasant feeling of my own aversion or irritation. And then I, I'm aware that that's suffering. Right? Sometimes you can ask yourself, is there suffering present? Is this painful? And then whatever hindrance that you experience when you're trying to meditate, there will be a painful mental feeling there associated with it. Whether we notice it or not, there is. Often we're kind of caught in the content, so we don't notice the feeling. But if you get somewhat adept at placing the seed of awareness in that heart area, you will notice that whatever hindrance is present, there's feelings there. And they're all unpleasant. If it's a hindrance, they're unpleasant. And so, you know, with sexual fantasy or whatever, it can be dizzying, there can be some kind of elation. But if you're looking at the heart area, the heart's oppressed, it's painful. And so I just go to that feeling and, I, and then recognizing that there's suffering present, May I, breathing in, may I be well, breathing out, may I be happy. Breathing in, may I be well, breathing out, may I be happy. And one of the wonderful challenges of working in Bogaya is that sometimes there's so much irritating phenomenon. For hours, so many people are ill-behaved that you have to practice so much metta that when you have kind of breakthroughs, you may have some quite illustriously profound and very amazing meta states because you just had to do so much of it as an antidote to in response to all of the inappropriate and bad men and poor behaved blah 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 you have to practice so much meta to get through it and then sometimes it's just meta a lot of meta it doesn't matter who did what you just 
happy, all beings will be well, may all beings be happy, all beings well, may all beings be happy. So once once you the metta chitta starts to flow as it were, then you increase it to include other beings. So and for myself, sometimes in Bogaya I just go from may I be well, may I be happy, may I be well, may I be happy. And then once metta's flowing, it becomes may I be well, may all beings be well, may I be happy, may all beings be happy. I just I just go from this mm. being that was previously suffering a bit, once that suffering's not there, okay, may all beings be well, may all beings be happy. But Gaia kind of inspires some uh, boldness or grandness in one's in one's uh, efforts. But uh, generally speaking, we go from the practicing for oneself to including beings for whom it is easy to feel loving kindness towards thee, or which whichever of your parents you got along with or feel natural gratitude, respect for, or parent-like figure or teachers for whom benefit us and we naturally feel gratitude. We include those types of beings first. And then the uh, larger numbers of neutral beings, and then eventually the beings you find difficult. But you do it, you know, you spend a few minutes on each, and then, and then eventually all beings everywhere. Thank you, but it's good to it's really important to work on that first stage because it's such an effective whenever you have suffering if you can just apply some loving kindness to yourself to that experience there's already less suffering just in that just in doing that much there's less suffering so everybody wants to be free from suffering so here's a summer to practice that reduces the amount of suffering very quickly if you become adept at it just sincerely yeah. wishing may i be well may i be happy aiming some unconditional love or some loving acceptance, some goodwill, some friendliness to your painful mind state. Just be kind to yourself. And then uh, you've got this tool that you can use whenever you need it. And oftentimes it can be used to kind of put the brakes on what might become a really unwholesome mind state. If you, beget, if you get adept at picking it up quickly and applying it sincerely, pacify that suffering, you know, pacify that reactivity, get the metta chitta going, and then it can become quite an expansive and illustrious mind state. But we do have to get that first that first level. So I think practicing with the metta chitta until the feeling of suffering <clears throat> really falls away from the mind. We just do it, we just do it, we just do it until that hindrance of ill will aversion, whatever it is, falls away. And then just enjoy, just enjoy the metta chitta and then expand it, include more beings. And we can see the uh, you know, Tanajana Nan does teach to cultivate metta as a support to cultivating the four foundations of mindfulness because it does lower the level of ill will. It already weakens the, um, the, the amount of ill will hindrance. And the Buddha does say in the 11 Benefits of Loving Kindness Sutta that for those who cultivate loving kindness, the mind becomes peaceful quickly and easily. So everybody wants a peaceful mind. Everybody's kind of struggling, trying to make their mind peaceful. And Lord Buddha gives very clear instruction that for those who cultivate metta, the mind becomes peaceful more easily, more quickly. So we, most of us need to do quite a bit of it. Thank you very much, Sadhu. It's another one of those practices that people think, oh, yeah, I should have metta. Oh, it's nice to be nice. And again, they kind of underestimate the profundity where it, where it can lead. Mm -hmm. It's actually possible. It's not so common, but it is possible to, to liberate your mind using the metta jhana. And uh, I think Lord Buddha describes it as the most beautiful of the liberations because the mind goes from this beautiful metta state to this beautiful liberated state. <laughs> it's already bright and beautiful. And then it goes from bright and beautiful to pure. And the way that the way that one can practice to develop insight with metta is if a person develops it to the point of apana, the jhana, then one trains in knowing as the mind comes out of that state, how it comes down to a more ordinary state from the jhanic state to the upajara state. And just in noticing that, okay, it's not in the absorption, it's in upajara, it's coming out of upajara, just noticing that change as the metta chitta kind of comes out of the jhanic state person can have an insight, practitioner can have an insight into impermanence and experience not self and be liberated. Mm, so, so another powerful 
very, very powerful meditation practice. Well, we've been also using uh, listening to the your chanting. I was able to download it, and uh, so it's very easy because we have it on easily on iMusic or something. But um, that's been very helpful as well. Uh, yeah, I wanted to. I was mindful that not everybody gets to live in a forest on a mountain, and and that people need tools to shift from a agitated, busy state sometimes to a more peaceful state. That's why I was involved in producing some chanting like that. I'm glad it was helpful. We appreciate that. Thank you very much. Very good. Sipida. Hi. Sipidae, hi. Hi, Adan. Hello, Adan. I am the girl from Iran. How are yeah, you doing? I'm, I'm, I'm good, so glad you. talking to you. Um, Ajahn, um, I read somewhere a long time ago that monks can um, feel so many numbers. I don't remember the numbers of the, the breath feeling. Like they feel uh, in the nose, they feel like they feel five different senses only in the nose. Or and then many more. I don't remember the numbers again. Uh, six numbers in the throat uh, and so on. So I was trying to figure that out with myself, and um, it's. Uh, I'm sure I'm not uh, <laughs> doing the great job as you are. So I was wondering if you can. I know it must be hard to put it on words, but uh, is it possible to tell us which feelings you're feeling? So I can, if it comes to words um, and I know it consciously, then I can find it more easily. Right. Yeah, I think I personally... Is it I... a hard question? I understand it's hard to put the words on feelings. But... No. So I think this is almost like a, my kind of sense is this is how your mind might be tricking you that if you think about it more you'll you'll, oh. you'll get it more and so in my experience it's just a you you just know it as it is without commenting on it at all so you don't have to comment oh. okay so i was to, doing it all wrong yeah don't comment don't think just know the feeling as the feeling and what you want to know is the beginning the middle, you want to know the entire breath, beginning, middle, and end, even the spaces in between, the beginning, middle, and end of the out breath. And when it, whatever thoughts come up, whatever comments about the breath, you kind of ignore them. And you, you just stick mm. with the knowing. And yes, every breath will be different. And yes, as the mind gets more sensitive, there's a lot of sensation in one breath, much more than people realize. But we just stick with the knowing of it. We don't need to comment on it. Okay, so I was doing it all uh, more logically than I should have. Well, I think this is normal. I was okay. saying before, people who people who uh, had been educated, who have a a lot of thinking minds, is we tend to do this. We tend to over intellectualize, and <laughs> it's it's actually more simple. The hard part is doing it enough and doing it consistently. That's the hard part. The methods methods themselves aren't that aren't that difficult. The hard part is sticking with the boring ordinariness of it until it becomes profound. <laughs> it's so great talking to you because you're so passionate about what you talk about that you I can love see through <laughs> the video that you're just loving it. <laughs> yeah, breath meditation is like my home. Thank so. you, John. Thank you so much. Wishing you all the Sadhu. Best. I know. <laughs> Sadhu, Sadhu. I would like to ask you in the Vina Panjare chanting, what does it mean by, um, well, I have to sign it. <laughs> um, sorry. Uh, the trouble beginning with those uh, uh, bound by the power of the Victorian realm. With seven fortress wall arrived against them, may all adversity within and without beginning with those caused by wind and be bile come to a complete end. What does it mean by the, 
speaking, those caused by wind and steel bias. Bile on wind, is it? Yeah. So I think that that has to do with like karmic afflictions, I think, in the body. So when you're when the wind element is experiencing some imbalance or the bile water element is experiencing some balance. So it's like the the prayer that the de the prayer and dedication that the body functions in harmony with uh with things things causing imbalance or disease to be pacified. So yeah. Thanks for that. Uh, maybe I could ask a quick question, if that's okay. Of course, you would. So with your kind of intensive meditation retreat in Bodh Gaya, um, and then returning back to your monastery with your duties there, um, how have you managed to keep some of that energy and yeah. take you know the I practice mean? back with you? <laughs> I left my suitcase on my bedroom floor three quarters unpacked so that I have to step over it or step around it every time I come to my kuti to remind myself, you've just been on pilgrimage and you made these aspirations, you made these vows, you made these aditanas, because we can, we can just slip into our old, old habits straight away. And uh, so I, I've left an obstruction in the middle of my pathway to remember, <laughs> remember those vows you made on so I, you know, I do, I'm pretty regular with my practice anyway, and it's more just trying to do it for longer sessions. So I do meditate before arms round, I do meditate after arms round, I do meditate in the afternoon, but I'm making the effort to just make sure it's for a longer period. And, uh, and that, you know, that just means doing less of the other stuff. So I haven't been able to do as much water painting as I was doing last year. <laughs> water painting of lotus is my new hobby and uh yeah and it's interesting because venerable sampano is doing a similar thing he's trying to maintain now because because he saw the specific benefits of sitting longer so did tan Joel. it's like we just kind of see that it's like oftentimes it's a bit of a struggle you sit for half an hour you sit 40 40 minutes you sit for 45 minutes and there's that sense of okay got a little bit of peacefulness and meditation's over now a bit of restlessness comes up or pain in the body but when you just when you're sitting for a three hour period, a two hour period, or a three hour period, you have to get through that, wriggle a bit, keep sitting, get past the hindrance, get past the restlessness. And what happens is the mind will often come to a more peaceful state for a longer period. And so anybody who wants the really deeper, more profound uh, results from practice, generally you need to to become you need to have longer sessions. So yeah, it's just being strict with that. Okay, I'm already in my, I'm already on my pillow, but just don't get up. Just you know, stay there a bit longer. Be strict, strict with the amount of hours again. And it's it is also helpful when you know there's another monk in the monastery that's doing a similar thing now. Tan Sampano made a commitment to doing six hours a day, and Panya Siri is actually working on getting from seven to eight hours a day at the moment. So I have some good Kalyanamitta, and uh, that's nice. Just seeing the faces of these other monks who are trying to practice similarly, very helpful. Get to the pillow a bit sooner, get off the meditation pillow a bit slower. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs>